Hey everyone, it's Katie from Bobby Hair Studio. And today I am gonna go through my list here that I've made of five reasons why you should not become a hairdresser if you can't handle these big things. These are all the hard truths to becoming a hairdresser and I, I consider them the top five and I'm gonna work my way from five to one. So uh, some people might not be happy with what I'm gonna say here and that is okay. Uh, this is just my opinion as a hairdresser who's been doing this for 10 years. So, um, you know, without further ado, let's get started. Let's start with number five. So number five is this job requires constant learning and it also requires constant criticism. So you have to be learning from day one till the day you retire in hairdressing. Hairdressing is an aesthetic and aesthetics are part of fashion and trends and these things are constantly changing, especially now. In the last 10 years, we have gone through, in like, you know, Western culture through dozens upon dozens upon dozens of trends and styles. We've, you know, made new things, we've regenerated things from the past and there's so much going on with hair and aesthetics these days that you have to keep up with the pack if you want to stay on trend and stay booked and busy. And uh, that requires you to be constantly learning. So hair school isn't gonna cut it. You know, you can't just come out of hair school and be like, I know everything I'm gonna know for hairdressing, like for the rest of my career. No, I would say hair school gives you the first 15%. The next 85. 85% don't check me on that math. The next 85% of that all comes down to what you're going to do for yourself with your learning. So are you going to go to classes? Are you going to be learning up on social media, on YouTube? What are you going to do to keep yourself growing and evolving and changing with the times? Because if you don't, you will eventually slow down and maybe stop or just have so much more to catch up on. So with this career, it requires constant change in education. And that does not mean that you have to pay for education. With this era of the internet, there's so much free education, mine for example, and you know, Guy Tang and so many other amazing, Zach Mesquite, the god of blondes, I just love him so much. There is so much free education online, you have no excuse. If you have a Wi-Fi signal and a smartphone, you can learn hair and you do not have to use expensive classes um, to upgrade your skill set. What a, an expensive class will give you that you don't get to have from YouTube is the physical touch. Um, and, the, and, the, and the good classes will provide you with an experience where you can get hands on. I don't mean physical touch like someone's touching you. I mean like you're getting hands on, you get to physically do what you are learning on like a mannequin head or on a model, someone who's, you know, signed a waiver versus if you look at you know one of my videos or Zach Skeets and you're trying a new formula or a new product you're learning that on your client so if you aren't willing to pay for classes then you have to pay through experience and if you weren't willing to pay through experience you have to pay through classes so if um, you're not someone who wants to continuously learn and grow and adapt to changing trends and times, then hairdressing is just not for you. Number four, there is a very, very long uphill growth battle in your first several years. Uh, this, is, this is not a career where you will hit the ground running after you graduate hair school or cosmetology school. You are not going to be at your A game in your first year, your second year, or your third year. You're not gonna be at your A game in any of this first five years, you're really not. You're gonna be constantly grinding, you're gonna be working on building a clientele and upping your skills and learning big valuable lessons about what to do and what not to do behind the chair and learning salon culture. So <clears throat> there's a lot that goes into your first few years one of the best things that I can say to all new hairdressers advice wise is say yes to everything. When you are a new hairstylist, say yes to every learning experience, say yes to every client, say yes to every service. 
You can't go into hair school and say, I'm going to be a balayage specialist and make $100,000 in my first year and come out of there and never have to do a men's cut or never have to do a perm or never have to do a kid's cut. None of us like doing that stuff. We just have to do it. That's just, that's part of building a clientele. You're providing a service. And when you work in a service industry, you don't automatically have that clientele to back you up. You have to build it. You have to build it by saying yes to everything because number one, <clears throat> You don't get paid if you don't work. If you don't do that men's cut, then you don't get the money from that men's cut. You you just sit there and you wait for another client and that could be hours, it could be days, it could be minutes, who knows what kind of salon you work in. But very few hairdressers who get into the industry are given an opportunity where they can be in such a fast paced environment where they get to say no to things that they don't wanna learn because they have no interest in it. If you say no to something in your first few years as a hairdresser, it should be on things that you you know you cannot do for someone in that consultation where let's just say a girl with already very blonde hair comes in and she says, I wanna go lighter. And you say, I don't know how to make you lighter without snapping your hair off. I don't know the skill set to do that. And she says, I want you to update my highlights because my roots are this long. You say yes. You say yes and you do it. And if you don't lift her up, light enough and her roots come out orange and you have to refoil that whole head of hair that's just something you have to learn how to do and if you pull out those foils and you had some breakage you pull out those foils and you didn't come all the way down quite close enough to where her previous foils were and you you didn't blend that in well enough or you didn't root shadow it well enough or you mixed up the wrong toner and things didn't blend and now you got banding those are all things you're just going to learn this is a constant learning environment and um these are things that you're going to need to do and this is all part of the growth period um, and the growth period is different for everyone it's a different length of time you're always going to be growing and always going to be learning but there is going to be an uncomfortable growth period in your first i would say three years after your first three years hopefully you've got enough under your feet enough experience under your feet that you can have some confidence in some of your skills and maybe start looking to a specialty but don't decide on your specialty in your first three years. Just do everything, do every client, try to build your clientele and try to make some money that you can. Number three, this is a hard one to hear and a lot of people are gonna argue with me on this one, but the pay sucks. It's, this is not a career that you get into for the money at all. Because the hairdressers that you see online that are like, oh, I'm $100,000 a year take home stylist. You know, this is what I make, I make, I make six figures. Those stylists are so few and far between. They are stylists who have years under their belt. They have specialties. They usually have brand deals, which people don't like to talk about. Uh, they are ambassadors for companies and they charge a lot because of the area they live in and the reputation that they've built for themselves. These are the people we all look up to, the people we all wanna be like, but there's, there's so few hairstylists who are making six figures a year take home behind the chair. And that's because of what they've built for themselves. This is not something that you're going to be getting very likely if you're a new stylist in your first five years. I feel like most stylists, probably 95% stylists make under $80,000 a year and that's okay. There are so many benefits to this job that aren't monetary benefits. The benefits of being a hairstylist that aren't monetary are things like um, your scheduling flexibility. If you work at a good salon um, that values you, as, <laughs> values you as a person, you're gonna have some flexibility in um, the hours that you work and your vacation time. Another thing that you get to build up over time as a seasoned stylist is a clientele of people you naturally vibe with or even your friends. I've been doing this for 10 years and I don't think I have a single client that I dislike anymore. In the first like five years, I had so many clients that I just didn't vibe with, even some that I disliked or wouldn't like have anxiety about having them on my schedule for several days before my appointment. I'd be like, oh, that lady's coming in. I just, she gives me problems every time. I don't have that anymore. My job 10 years in, is easier than my job three years in versus I find that some jobs, like the more you get paid, the more experience you, you have more under your belt, it's more difficult. It's easier for me now to work behind the chair with my clients because I genuinely like them all and I've built a clientele of people that I like. 
Um, my job every day is I get to make people feel great about themselves. I get to work with color. I get to be really creative. I get to problem solve. I get to work with sick ass hairstyle. I don't know if I can say that. Awesome, sick, sick ass. <laughs> awesome hairstyles that I love and the ones I've hired and you know, they're, they're amazing people and we're all friends and we, we have a great environment together in the salon. And, and there's so many things that, that you do in this job that so many well-paying jobs don't get. Like there's a lot of jobs you could do in tech and the job itself, coding all day, not fun. But I do promise you that toning with fashion colors and giving really fun haircuts and laughing with your client for hours who brought you a venti Starbucks, like that, like that's the benefit of this job. Like I'm enjoying my time and me enjoying my time at my job is worth more than the money that I make from a job that I dislike. So what the trade-off is here is you're not gonna make insane money. You're just not, unless, unless you're a celebrity stylist, like let's be honest, if you're Chris Appleton, yeah, you're gonna make insane money because Kim's your client. There's not a billion Kims on the planet, so we can't all just, we can't all have billionaires as our clients. Like that's just, that's who, that's what it is. And that's okay, that's okay, because again, the trade-off is all the other things that I just mentioned. Number two is a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow in reality, but it's something everybody thinks that they can just hear and take, is taking responsibility for when you mess up. Uh, Everyone would probably agree that, uh, you know, when you mess up, you need to own up to your mess ups. Um, not everyone will agree that the client is always right. But I'm gonna say something a little controversial. And as a hairstylist, I personally feel like the client is always right with an asterisk. Um, they're always right in the way where if they don't like what they're looking at, they don't like what they're looking at. They have to wear their hair around their face. And this is aesthetics. It's, it's you and how you see yourself and how you look at yourself. And even if the client is wrong, they are right. If they don't like something, they don't like it. Now it comes down to how you want to deal with that, but your, your approach to it should always be, I want to make you happy with your hair. If I can't be the person to do that, because of how our connection is or how our communication is or because of my skill set versus your expectations, any of those things, that's okay to, to be able to, to dismiss someone from your clientele based on those things. But if, if you mess up, even if you didn't mess up, if you cut the hair wonky and it's, and it's sideways or whatever, yeah, accept the responsibility for that. Most people can admit to when they've done something wrong it's not super common once you have a few years under your belt to actually do something noticeably wrong behind the chair. Um, oftentimes it is a miscommunication or there is a chemical reaction to the hair, but when it does happen, you need to be able to take ownership of that. And when it happens based on what the client has said to you and you've done exactly what the client did ask for, the client's still not happy, it's not necessarily on you for the wrong that happened because there was no wrong that really happened. The client doesn't like how they look. It's up to you to respond to that in a professional way and to be able to, yeah, take responsibility into your hands to make them like what they see. There's a big difference between when you talk with a client who is unhappy with their hair um, or when you say uh, someone, someone has uh, an expectation that you can't deliver on because their hair won't be able to handle it. Let's just say, again, the blonde client comes in and she wants to be blonder. Um, there's a difference between saying, you can't have what you want versus I can't give you what you want. Maybe no one on this planet can give you what you want, that's fine. But when you say, I can't give you what you want, a client is going to take that with a lot more respect to you and a lot more understanding than for you to say, you can't have what you want. Now, if they cannot have what they want, that's okay. But it comes down to things like wording and, and being able to stand there and listen to your client 
when they're upset with something or when they want you to do something that you know you can't deliver on, it comes down to your communication style. And again, for this job, it, it requires a lot of tools in the tool belt to do it well. And I would say communication is your hammer. You're gonna be using that all the time. Uh, number one, personality matters. Uh, if you do not have a personality that can handle confrontation on a daily basis, you should not be a hairstylist. If you are someone who's quite stubborn or bullheaded or you have a bit of an ego, you can't be a hairstylist, a new hairstylist. <laughs> um, this is all things that you, that you need to have as a new hairstylist to make it into the industry. And I know some people have all the years under their belt. Now they have an ego. That's fine. They earn that ego. That's all good. But when you're a new hairstylist, you have to be able to take constructive criticism. You have to be able to take just criticism and you have to be able to take haters on pretty well because some of those haters are going to be in your chair. Some of them are going to be other stylists in the salon. Some of them are going to be online, but you need to have a personality that can handle tough things that are said to you. You also need to be able to um, handle clientele that aren't happy with you. And a, and a lot of this that I've said today is all about how clients handle you and how you handle clients and all of that, because communication, again, is like the biggest thing in this industry. Um, if you don't have the skill set that comes with a good bedside manner of like dealing with a client who's sitting there and they're doing a test strand and it's not turning out the way they wanted, but they're still trying to press you into doing a service or they're trying to like tell you how to do your job or you know they're not happy with the hair you've given them. Whatever it is, you need to have a good bedside manner. You can have a good bedside manner and be a quiet person naturally or be someone who's boisterous. It's not about those personality traits, whether you are good at conversationalism or conversationalism. I don't know if that's a real word, but if you're, if you're good at conversing with people or if you're bubbly or if you're a little bit quieter and more reserved, those will all find their clientele over time. This is about the, the customer service part of your personality. Do you have good customer service? These are things that you need to have and you need to be able to humble yourself and put your ego, leave your ego at the door when you come into your job because again, we are providing a service for people. We are doing our best to do what they have asked for. Now that's not always something that we can do. It's hard when we're working with chemicals and, and art at the same time, because those don't always mix. <laughs> but uh, if you can't do these things, you have to get really, really good at being a chameleon and blending into your environment or mirroring your clients. Um, cause sometimes that's the only way to get through a six hour appointment with a client that you just don't jive with is you have to just mirror them and put on that fake personality and, um, and find something to talk about or, you know, silent appointments cause that's a godsend. Anyways, I'd like to know what you guys think about what my top five, you know, necessities are for being a successful hairstylist. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you disagree with anything that I've said, that's totally fine. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are and maybe what you guys think the top five qualities are in a good hairstylist. Those would all be good things to know as well. I think it just comes down to what my thoughts are today. It comes down to communication and humility and the willingness to grow uh, as well as longevity. You're in here for the long haul and you're not here for the money. You're here for the career, the experience, and the fact that you get to go to work each day and enjoy what you're doing at your job and go home with a decent paycheck. It's not the best one in the world again, but it's a decent paycheck. So let me know what you guys think. Have a great day.